Welcome, and thanks for listening to the Big Ideas for Better Places podcast today. If you like what you hear, we encourage you to please leave us a rating and a review on iTunes or wherever you're listening to this. This really helps other folks find out about the podcast, our great guests, and the wisdom that they have to share. So without further ado, on to today's episode. Please listen carefully. Welcome to the Big Ideas for Better Places podcast from CityWorks Expo. My name is Brad Stevens, and I'll be your host today. It's my absolute pleasure to introduce you to our guest, Mr. Ash Blankenship, the founder of Parksify. How are you doing today, Ash? Hey, Brad. I'm pretty good. Thanks so much for having me on the show. Of course. It's good to have someone from the left coast here. I feel like we're a little a little right coast centric, so I'm glad to have somebody to kind of uh, subvert that view in some ways. Yeah, I think it's good to diversify every once in a while, right? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Well, now, uh, tell us a little bit about uh, about yourself and your work and where you kind of fit in this in this question of creating better places. Yeah, absolutely. So I originally founded Parksify in 2013, and the idea, if you can believe this, actually came to me in a dream. And it's one of those dreams where I woke up during the middle of the night, and I just happened to write the name of Parksify down on a piece of paper. <laughs> and I woke up the next morning, and I saw this piece of paper laying there, and I didn't really remember the dream. And it said Parksify on the piece of paper. So I immediately checked to see if Parksify.com was available, and it was. And that was kind of the start of Parksify. And since then, we've kind of grown the site. It's actually turned into a podcast now. So in September 2015 um, is actually when I launched the podcast. And it's something that I'm just kind of growing and focusing on more now. Originally, the site was written content. It was articles and columns about urban public spaces. But now my main focus is on the podcast because I feel like it has a broader reach and it can reach more people that way and be able to you know, talk with planners and urbanists and to tell more stories. Well, interesting. I'm, I'm, I'm guessing that looking back now, you realize that that dream was actually about something entirely different from this project. Is that true? It definitely was, yes. <laughs> well, I'm just imagining waking up and, and finding a note on my door that said, this is what your future holds. That's, a, that's an exciting moment, I imagine. It, it is, yeah. And I have to give a big hat tip to, to uh, Jacob Moses, who actually helped me get the podcast started. Um, he was actually someone I met on Twitter a while back, and he had a podcast at the time. And he reached out to me and said, hey, you know, we should start a podcast for Parksify. So that's how that all got started. And he helped me get it started and get it going. And he was the co-host for a short time. Um, he's now gone on to open his own store in um, his hometown of Denton, Texas. So that's really exciting for him. But yeah, I definitely have to give a big thanks to him for helping me get this started. Well, very good. Well, I, I'm intrigued to ask, what kind of got you interested in these questions of public space or urban spaces in general? Yeah. So when I moved to D.C., which was in 2011, I believe, I started writing for a site called Urban Times. And I'm not sure if they're still around, but I was writing columns about the built environment and I started doing some research around that. And it's something that I really learned that I had a strong interest in. You know, I grew up in the South. I grew up in a small town and living in D.C. kind of changed my perspective on the way we should live and the environment that we can live in. Mm. And, you know, my life vastly improved when I moved to D.C. because I was able to walk. I didn't have to depend on a car. So I had this urban environment surrounding me. And that really, really influenced me to want to do something to share kind of my experience and to let others share their experiences as well. Hmm. So is your background journalism stuff then or, or where are you kind of coming at this from? Um, it's not, but at the time when I was at the, um, or when I was in DC, I was at the Center for Public Integrity, which was um, a nonprofit journalism organization. I was doing fundraising there at the time, but you know, having being around journalists at the time, it was something that you know really had a big impact on my life. Interesting. Well, I'm, I'm wondering, is there a, a particular uh, experience that kind of uh, opened your eyes to the possibilities of what? public space can be or is there a story that sticks out from that first year in DC is like uh, I really enjoy this space mm -hmm. I think that was really key I think it was just being in that urban environment having grown up in such a small town and I could see you know the really big difference in having a place where you could walk or where you could bike places and how it changed your life and how I was happier and I felt healthier mm -hmm. and it just you know it, it changed my life on so many levels and I think that was a really really big impact 
Hmm. Well, and you've we were talking a little bit before we came on air that you've seen that the impact from your podcast goes beyond just those that you kind of anticipated would be listening, mm-hmm. and that kind of speaks to this as well. That you know you didn't come into this as an expert; you came in as someone who was found that their life was improved by these places and, and these mm-hmm. spaces, and you wanted to then dig in more. And so, are you finding the same thing with the people that are listening to your podcast? Yeah, you know, I am finding that. I'm finding that a lot of people who listen to the podcast. They're not necessarily planners or aspiring planners or even folks who consider themselves urbanists. So, for example, they're like they're the, the teller at the bank or the clerk at the post office. But they can they can really kind of attach themselves to the topics in the podcast because they experience public spaces themselves and they can relate to that. And they know the importance of those places. You know, they they know what it's like when they get off at the post office and they take their kid to the park. You know, they can really witness the impact of that and see that firsthand. So I think that's one thing that I I found really surprising. And it was also impressive to know that there's ordinary people out there every day who have an interest or even a passion for urban public spaces. Hmm. It it kind of speaks to me about this, this... hidden depth of wisdom that we sometimes don't tap into when we're thinking about these spaces. Is that, uh, is that something that resonates with you? Yeah, you know, I believe it does. And, you know, I, I think kind of now and, you know, going through your questions too, when I was preparing for this, this conversation that we're having, I initially thought, you know, I don't know how I'm going to be able to answer these questions. But when I actually sat down, I was I was thinking to myself, you know, I know a lot more than I think I know (laughs) because, you know, I have this experience and I've had so many conversations about, you know, public spaces and parks and placemaking with some really great people and some really great planners and urbanists and authors. So I think that's really helped me to learn a lot about this type of work. And, you know, I definitely want to use Parksify as a medium to kind of get that message out. Have there been uh, conversations that have kind of been central in changing your your viewpoint on things? Or have, I guess, what's, what's the most recent thing that you heard that kind of shook your opinion about what public spaces can be? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I have so many great examples that I could talk about. There are a few things that really stand out. Um, you know, I think one thing that kind of goes to, you know, about why parks matter to to people. And, you know, I really kind of think that there's there's something I've learned over the past few years while speaking with urbanists and planners is that parks really bring people together. You know, and we've seen um, I know we've all seen these renderings of proposed parks and what do they all have? You know, they have people acting happy and people coming together to play games and people chatting and relaxing in a park. And when these parks are designed right, that that is the actual outcome, you know, but I think, too, it's like, you know, you see these images and you you also see parks that aren't being used as much. You know, I I think and I'm just kind of using real world examples here. You know, there's a park near me that's just kind of an open green space. There's a few trees and some benches that are down, you know, and the city considers that a park. You know, and I don't see that that public space and that green space being used very often. There's, you know, a few people sitting on the benches every once in a while, but there aren't people actually coming together. It's not like a centralized destination for people. And I would really love to see, you know, more things for people in that area. Um, And I think that really comes down to really communicating with the neighbors and communicating with people within the community and saying, okay, what would you like in this park? Because I really think there could be some vast improvements. And I see that all the time. You know, I see, you know, cities just saying, okay, we're going to create a little green square. We're going to throw in a few trees, put in some benches and call it a park. You know, that to me is not a park unless that's something that the community really wants. And they want it exactly that way. But odds are they're going to want something else or they're going to want something more. You know, so I really think it comes down to really talking with the community and talking with people and, and maybe even... Um, maybe even voting, you know, and having people come in and say, okay, these are the projects that we could put into this park. What would you like to see? And have people actually take part in that and to vote. And then that also gives them ownership to that park too. So they could go to that park later and say, hey, you know, I voted to have this art sculpture and now it's here, you know, so I took part in having this, this being placed inside the park. So I think things like that can be really powerful. Well, it's interesting because you mentioned, you know, that the, the, what we should hope for parks is that they bring people together. But it sounds like also 
in order to create a park that works, you almost have to bring people together before the fact is, as well. Uh, mm-hmm. So that they can be crucial in creating the space as well, don't you? Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's definitely true. Hmm. Well, I'm, I'm intrigued because you're in somewhat of a special place to think about <laughs> parks being in, mm-hmm. in the Los Angeles area, a place that's not particularly well known for its parks, if I, if I may say so. Mm-hmm. Um, I remember there was a podcast that um, Malcolm Gladwell did recently talking about how essentially most of the large green spaces in uh, the Los Angeles area are p- golf courses that are not open to the public. Uh, mm-hmm. And so I'm wondering, like in a in a place that doesn't seem to to value parks as much as some other places might, how do you kind of uh, encourage that, or do you see that there are impacts of the of a there not being large public spaces available? Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, and one of the the first things to come to mind when I always think about public spaces in Los Angeles is Echo Park Lake, and I really like Echo Park Lake because they've done a really great job at kind of bringing people together as a destination park. And it, it's, it, it definitely has a lake, you know, and so it suits its name. Um, but when you go there, it's this very vibrant green space. This is very beautifully done. Um, not only did they do a lake, but on the one end of the lake, they did like a marsh. So they kind of made it a little different. So it really attracts a lot of, you know, birds and things there as well. Um, they put pedal boats there so you can actually rent a pedal boat and you can pedal around the lake. And there's a trail that goes around the lake. And nearby, there's also restaurants, and there are coffee shops, and there are things to do. So, you know, you could spend a Sunday going there. You could go to the coffee shop. You could go to the farmer's market. You could walk around the lake. So it kind of encapsulates all of these different things, and it brings people together because you can go there not just to to walk around the lake, but you can go there to, you know, actually get on the lake in the pedal boat and to, you know, spend, you know, an afternoon, you know, lounging in the sun near, near the lake and, There's all these different things. They have grills there, so you see a lot of families there grilling. So it's really bringing people together, and it's bringing people together from a lot of socioeconomic backgrounds as well. So you see a big mixture of people there, um, which I think is really great. I think Mm -hmm. they did a really great job at, you know, not only redeveloping this part, but redeveloping it in a way to where it really brings people together and it has something for everyone. Do you so in some ways the the parks need to move in the same direction that lots of our development does, and that the more kind of multi use that we can make a place, the better it is in general. Is that something that kind of resonates with you? Yeah, absolutely. And you know, kind of talking more about you know L.A. public spaces and parks. There's also Griffith Park, which is a I think one of the largest public parks in the country. Um, and I go there often. There's a lot of hiking trails and stuff there. And, you know, it's a it's a place where a lot of people go, a lot of tourists go to look at it, too. There's a great view of the Hollywood sign from there. Um, so, you know, you have things like that. So L.A., while a lot of people talk about Los Angeles as not having great green spaces, they're definitely kind of picking up what they do and moving forward with things and making better places. And, you know, I've had conversations, too. Like I had a recent conversation with Omar Brownson. Um, who is the executive director of River LA, which is a nonprofit that's doing some great work around the Los Angeles River and kind of turning that into really a green space and also a place for trails. And, you know, the Los Angeles River, it, it runs through much of the city. And it's it's a very long section that people can use to connect with other neighborhoods. So you have not only this proposed green space being created from this river that's already there, But you also have this connection that is planned to, you know, really connect different neighborhoods and to bring people together. Interesting. Well, I think that, you know, there are times that, you know, you know, it's great to see that that that's improving there. And I'm uh, I'm I'm wondering, too, how you kind of make that a priority so that there's so many different things that cities can focus on and. You know, it's becoming more clear that green space matters. But how do you kind of convince policymakers or community advocates that parks matter and that they they're important for communities? You know, my goal is really just about sharing the stories. I don't really feel like I'm an advocate for anything. Um, I definitely want to just share these messages with people and to give the planners and the urbanists and the authors outlets to be able to mm. talk about projects that they're working on and then to let people go out and do what they feel like is best in their neighborhood. I really feel like change comes at such a localized level. Mm. And I'll give you an example. One idea I had personally, 
And this is just from the things that I've learned over the past few years about placemaking and planning. So near me, so I recently moved just a few months ago, and I'm in a very walkable neighborhood now, which I love. I mean, the days that I don't need to drive, I don't drive. And I will walk to get lunch. I will walk to the, the library even. I've actually been reading more because of it. So it's really, it's really improved my life a lot. But nearby, just a few blocks away, there's this crosswalk. And it's a crosswalk that has a diagonal crosswalk as well. So it's a really populated area. There are a lot of people around. It's near a shopping center. But this crosswalk is not painted. And I really feel like it needs to be painted, but not only with, you know, white stripes like normal crosswalks are, I really feel like it needs to be something artistic and something creative, you know, maybe painted in, you know, diagonals, like in shapes or something like that and make it look really cool and colorful. Um, And I've seen other towns and cities doing the same thing. And I would really love to see the city of Glendale do that. So, you know, I may actually be taking my first step into some advocacy and reaching out to the city council or reaching out to someone in the planning office to try to, you know, kind of get that to happen and move forward. I mean, my goal, I would love to see, you know, like maybe a school come together to get the youth involved in painting the crosswalk or something that really gives people in the local community that sense of ownership while also creating this really great crosswalk in a really colorful and artistic manner and in a way, kind of turning that crosswalk into a placemaking project. So, you know, I really think it's important that we kind of just do our own thing, but do it in a way to where whatever we feel like we want to go after, we can go after it. So, you know, I've talked with like Jeff Speck, for example. Jeff Speck was a really great guest. He talked about cars and, you know, I could sit here and tell you why you shouldn't have a car, but I don't believe that because if you feel like you really need a car to be able to go around and pick all the kids up or to take the kids to school, that's that's perfectly fine, you know. So I try not to advocate one way or another. You know, I see the benefits of having a car. I see the benefits of walkability, which I believe outweigh, you know, the, the benefits of having a car. But at the same time, I'm not going to sit here and, and tell anyone you shouldn't have a car or, you know, I think of you as a less person because you have a car, you know, something like that. So I I try to stay really neutral on, you know, specific topics. And I really want to kind of get the message out and let people make their own decisions, but give them the information they need to not only make the decisions, but to be able to go out and activate and to begin making change. Hmm. Well, so I'm intrigued to to know kind of when you're with this project that you're potentially interested in taking on, kind of how that, you know, how you're talking with all these folks is informed uh, your decision to kind of think about maybe getting involved locally. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, there's some particular conversations I've had with people that I think are really important. Um, I did actually have someone on the show recently, uh, Malenko Matanovic, and he's actually the founder of the Seattle-based Pomegranate Center, and they actually work with local communities to design and build better public spaces. So when I thought about that crosswalk, I kind of thought about the work that Malenko and his team are doing at the Pomegranate Center because what they do is actually involve the public in the building phase of the public space projects. So residents actually get their hands dirty, so to speak, and they actually hammer and build these products physically. Um, so I think it's a really unique program, and it's the only one that I know of. But you know, I mentioned that because it kind of goes back to the crosswalk and how I would love to see a school get together and kind of bring the youth in and have them work on the crosswalk and to paint it together and, you know, to really get the community involved. And I think that would help bring people together. And like I mentioned, give that sense of ownership, you know, and then, the, you know, the kids could go there and say, hey, look at this crosswalk. I painted this square on this crosswalk, something like that. Hmm. Well, it's interesting that you, you know, you've, you're documenting at the same time these people that have done these kind of this kind of work and are engaged in doing interesting things. And at the same time, you're kind of starting your own path down this road. And it's a really fascinating place to be in, to be able to learn from all these folks that you're talking with. And I, I have to imagine that that's a, uh, it kind of pushes you down that road of wanting to do more yourself. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it absolutely does. And, you know, it's something that I like to talk to people about outside of the podcast. I have some really good friends who are planners. So we'll get together and talk about some of these projects and, you know, kind of share information and, when I initially thought about this crosswalk, the first thing I did was email some planners that I know and some friends of mine 
and say, hey, what should be the first step, you know, that I should take to kind of push this forward? So, you know, there's that that connection and that sense of community and also having that network to be able to um, kind of talk with other people to you know, figure out what you need to do. Because when I started it and I had the idea, I thought, you know, this is a great idea, but what is the first step? And even having had all of these conversations, I really wasn't sure what the first step was. So to have these people that you could actually have a conversation with or um, to be able to ask questions, I think is really helpful. So again, I think it comes down to even like the first step, it, it's going to involve other people and you, you have to have other people that are around you that understand things. And uh, that's kind of what I've learned. You know, even in that time, I emailed some planners that I had spoken with on the podcast and said, hey, what's the first step I should do? So, you know, it's kind of building that network and giving me access to that. And I want other people to have that, too. Um, one reason, Brad, that I, I kind of bring this up, too, is that recently, just last week, I launched a Facebook group. And the, pro- the, the purpose of this Facebook group is to continue the conversation outside of the podcast. So, for example, if I have a guest on the show and you're listening to the show and you're like, I really want to ask this guest a particular question. And, you know, you don't get that answer during the podcast. Well, I want to be able to give people that opportunity to sit down and say, hey, I heard you on the podcast. It was great to hear about this topic. I have one quick question, you know, and to keep that conversation going, because I really think that that's kind of what what Parksify is all about is to kind of, you know, helping amplify people's voices and to giving them access to particular people that they need access to, to kind of spread information and to co- build a community in a sense. Well, it's it, that spreading of information is becoming more and more important because I think, you know, we've seen mm-hmm. that n- a number of communities have dealt with some issues so that, you know, you're interested in, in this, in this crosswalk, but it's nice to know that you're not the first person that's had these questions in some way, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Yeah, Absolutely. And, you know, I can look at other cities like Santa Monica, for example, who did a, a really great crosswalk recently. And it's it's painted. It's very colorful. It stands out. It's beautiful, really. And, you know, I'm sure I'm not the only person to have had an idea of, hey, let's paint a crosswalk in my neighborhood. Well, it, I think really part of the work that, that you do is maybe even to, to, to share with people that, hey, when you have that idea, uh, don't just sit on it, that you know, these are people that have had ideas and actually done something with them and you can do the same. Uh, mm-hmm. is, is that something that you find uh, is true as well? Yes, absolutely. Um, I definitely find that to be true. And I feel like everyone has a voice and a lot of people I think don't start because they don't know where to start. And that's kind of what I'm hoping to to bridge that, that knowledge gap there and to give people not only the information they need to move forward, but maybe even motivate people to, to move forward with certain projects as well. Do you find that internet platforms can be a help with that? I mean, you mentioned your Facebook group, and that seems like an interesting mm-hmm. way to use that. Is there, are there other ways that you found that that uh, you know digital platforms have allowed you to or people to accomplish change in a way that's kind of new and different? Um, yeah, there are a few things I I really think about, and um, there's um, some kind of Kickstarter type projects that are out there to where you can go online and actually set up a campaign to start raising funds to do small projects. Um, there's one actually called IOB, which is based in New York, and I actually did a podcast episode with them as well. And, you know, they talk a lot about these people coming together in their community and raising funds on the IOB platform and then kind of moving that forward. And IOB, by the way, stands for In Our Backyard, which I think is a really cool name because you're actually taking your backyard or your you know, your local public space in your neighborhood and transforming it and building a community around it. And when they, then when you kind of raise funds for it, when you crowdfund it, you're getting everyone who gives a dollar, ten dollars, for example, you're giving them kind of part ownership of it because they're actually helping you move forward. So you're kind of building that network and that community around it. So, yeah, there are some platforms out there that are, I think, really helping to kind of amplify these issues and help people kind of move forward with, you know, certain small projects. We'd like to take a moment now to say thank you to our sponsors today. 
The Urban Affairs and Planning Program at Virginia Tech School of Public and International Affairs offers an interdisciplinary approach to understanding planning and policy for mega regions, cities, suburbs, and rural regions in the U.S. and abroad. UAP faculty have expertise in urban planning, architecture, urban design, economics, geography, political science, law, technology, and engineering, and provide students with a multifaceted understanding of how communities grow and change. Students apply their knowledge and professional skills by participating in real-world problem-solving with community clients through project-based studios and applied research. UAP emphasizes technical analysis and policy evaluation in approaching the complexities of modern communities. So a big thanks today to the Urban Affairs and Planning Program down at Virginia Tech for being our sponsor. If you'd like to hear more, check them out online. But without further ado, we'll get back to today's guest. Thank you. Well, I'm also interested because you, you kind of exist in, in my mind at this at the intersection of two really fast growing movements, one being this this how do we understand public space and how do we make best use of it? But then also uh, green space is incredibly important and, and we need to we've seen all kinds of health and social benefits from increasing green space. And I wonder kind of, you know, where do you see those movements kind of going moving forward? Yeah, you know, that's a great question. So I, I truly believe that there is a large movement that's taking place regarding the importance of green space. And I know that there are many other people I've talked to who would actually agree with me. And I think we're finally seeing cities begin to transform streets into public spaces or places for pedestrians and cyclists. You know, we're seeing more mixed use development that incorporates forms of nature. We're seeing revitalizations of waterfronts. And with these changes, our cities are are really improving and becoming more livable. Uh, I think it's easy to that these uh, these changes are the results of of planners and government officials, but I believe that the movement for more green space actually begins with the citizens. Hmm. And I, but I think once we realize the importance of green spaces within our cities, many people they really begin to mobilize for this cause and demand more and better parks and public spaces. And I think as a result of that, our towns and our planners have actually begun to recognize this. And you know, I can give you an example. You know, I, I believe that the the movement overall, you know, like I mentioned, it begins with citizens. And there have been some great planners who have done some work to build momentum as well to move projects forward. Um, and one example that I'd like to give is that Brent Tadarian, um, while chief planner in Vancouver, oversaw the redevelopment of the city's waterfront and many other aspects of the city's public spaces. And as a result, Vancouver is now one of the most well-known cities when it comes to identifying places with great green spaces. So we have to give planners a, you know, a kind of a tip of the hat here. And oftentimes it's, it's planners who want to do more, but they're often limited due to, you know, budget constraints or similar challenges. But overall, I think there is a movement that's taking place, but I think the movement actually begins with the people. Do you, um, how do you kind of see this playing out in terms of, I think that we've seen uh, that the green spaces are absolutely becoming of more importance, but there's not always equitably distributed, I think it's fair to say, that a lot of times that the wealthier neighborhoods wind up with more green space and those that, that are without wind up at even more of a disadvantage by not having parks or green space around them. Is there uh, a way that you kind of see to kind of rectifying that situation? You know, I think it really comes down to just kind of bringing the community together. I think a lot of people are afraid of the unknown or they're afraid of change. So, for example, you know, like the L.A. River actually has plans for some pedestrian bridges that are going to connect neighborhoods from opposite sides of the river. And there's some people who are resisting that because, you know, they have their neighborhood on, you know, the east side of the river. But what's what's the neighborhood like on the west side of the river, you know? And I think a lot of people are really afraid of that change and they're afraid of you know, what's going to happen? Is it going to bring more cyclists into the neighborhood? You know, are people are going to be, you know, loud and going to come over at night and be making a lot of noise and keep me awake? You know, so so many people have so many questions like that. But really, I think, you know, that fear is a fear of the unknown. But when it comes to actually kind of connecting these people and connecting neighborhoods and connecting different people from socioeconomic backgrounds, when people actually come together, none of that ever happens it turns out great, you know? So I think a lot of times people are just, you know, they're afraid of change and people are afraid of change overall, you know, in many aspects of their lives, you know? 
So I think that's why we have people who are, are NIMBYs and who say, no, I don't want that in my backyard. But then, you know, a lot of times when it happens, it, it's not as bad as it seems or it's not bad at all, actually. It actually ends up being great. So you're bridging these communities, you're connecting people from other neighborhoods. But yeah, I mean, I do see a lot of, you know, a lot of that where you have great public spaces, you have great parks and, you know, higher income neighborhoods. Um, I know for a fact that I've read a lot about how higher income neighborhoods have more trees, you know, and more trees improves people's health. So people in higher income neighborhoods have better health because they live in better places. And, you know, it's really unfortunate that, you know, we don't focus more on, you know, planting trees in lower income neighborhoods, because what if they could benefit them and give them better health? You know, it's bringing them up to another level. So I think we could use little things like that to actually really improve neighborhoods. And I have seen, you know, going back to Echo Park Lake in Los Angeles, when I moved here and I would tell people, oh, I love going to Echo Park Lake. And they were like, well, you should have seen it a few years ago. If you were to have gone there a few years ago, it was a place where you buy drugs, like people were doing drugs on the sidewalk. It was very unsafe. You would get mugged. And, you know, it's not like that now because they came in and re-transformed this, this public space into something that's really great now and that brings communities together. And it made the whole neighborhood a lot safer. So now you have, you know, these coffee shops that have popped up and these restaurants that have came in. Bookstores are there now. So you have all of these things that kind of came together based on that redevelopment. And it's really boosted the neighborhood up. And I would really love to see a lot more of that. But, um, you know, you've lived a number of places. You mentioned growing up in the South, living in D.C., mm-hmm. um, living in L.A. now, and I imagine you visited a number of others. And I wonder, as you kind of go to different places or as you visit a new place, are there indicators that tell you some a place is doing well? Or what do you kind of look for and or what kind of tips you off that some place is working well or not working so well? Yeah, you know, I think it comes down to walkability because that's a really big, important topic for me and to have walkability I think is something that's really important Um, when you have great public spaces and you have great parks and you can walk to them in under 10 minutes it really transforms your life Um, so New York for example and I really think New York could even have more public spaces and more parks in small neighborhoods so you don't have to you know spend 15-20 minutes on the subway going to Central Park or going to you know another park of your preference So I really think having public space and green space within a 10 minute walk is something that's very important. And if you don't have that, I mean, here in L.A., if I want to go to Griffith Park, for example, or Echo Park Lake, I have to get in my car and spend 20 minutes driving there. And that kind of degrades the impact of that public space. So when I see a city that does walkability really great, I think of walkability as like it's kind of a net in a way that's kind of holding all of these other pieces of the city together. So you have public spaces, you have parks, you have public squares and green spaces and all of these different places that are, I think, really kind of held together by walkability. So if you can have really great walkable neighborhoods with all of these places and short blocks too, um, you're going to get more people out on the street. You're going to get more people using these public spaces and green spaces. So I, I would say walkability is one thing that's key. So when I moved to L.A., I was... I was really shocked. You know, I I had been here before and, you know, I knew it was a very car centric city. Um, So, you know, rating, you know, L.A. on walkability level, it doesn't rate as high as D.C. You know, when I lived in D.C., I didn't have a car. I walked to work, I biked to work and it really transformed my life. So moving to L.A. was kind of a a step back in a way, you know, in that aspect. but LA is actually doing a lot and I think they recognize that they need to kind of up their game and to kind of catch up with some of the other larger cities in the country and to create more walkability and they're expanding their subway. So you have all these different connection points and different areas of, of transportation that you could take. And, you know, I think that's great, but they definitely need to improve walkability even more and, and improve cycling as well. Yeah, there's so many streets here that would do much better with cycling lanes, protected bike lanes, and they don't have that. You know, they'll put in, you know, these, uh, I'm sure you've seen these two, where it's a picture of a, a bicycle with a little arrow. Mm-hmm. They'll put that on the street and kind of say, oh, well, we have access for bikes. No, no, you don't. Um, 
So, you know, I think we can learn from each other there. We can learn from other cities. Um, but yeah, going back to your, your question, and I really think that when I look at a city and I say this city really has it together, most of the time it's a city that's very walkable. Interesting. And do you think that part of that, the importance of that walkability also comes down in that it forces you to see and be around other people in some ways? Yeah, you know, I think it kind of goes back to the whole Jane Jacobs idea of eyes on the street, street and having people um, out on the street all the time and having short blocks. I mean, nobody wants to spend 15 minutes walking down one block, you know. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I really think it, it, it does. It, it brings people together. It brings people out on the street. You have more eyes on the street. It increases safety. You know, a lot of people think that, you know, kind of going back to the old school way of thinking, having people on the streets going to mean that you're going to have more crime. That's not true. You're going to have actually the opposite effect. Um, so, yeah, I think it, it definitely brings people together. And that's a good thing. Hmm. Well, you know, you've been doing this podcast uh, for three years now, two years now. Um, the podcast started in September 2015. So just over a year for the actual podcast. Um, okay. Parks if I launched in 2013 um and it originally launched just as a blog um so i've come a long way and kind of tailored parksify to you know what the readers and listeners want well i'm intrigued to know kind of uh, since you've started that is there something that stands out as something you've learned that you now think is important that you wouldn't necessarily have considered or thought important when you started yeah you know i i believe i'm always learning and I've learned so much over the past few years. You know, I'm not a planner. I didn't study planning. And really all that I've learned has come from either the books that I've read or the people I've spoken with. So when I launched Parksify, I didn't know much about urban public spaces or urban design and development, but I knew it was a topic I wanted to learn more about. So I really immersed myself in it. And Parksify was a great way of doing that. You know, and some of the key things that, that really stand out or one particular thing that really stands out is that during my time of having these conversations with people, patterns have actually emerged. Mm. And these patterns, it, it kind of goes something like this. It's like parks and public spaces are essential to the livelihood of city, city dwellers. They're good for our health. They bring us together, so they're really good for our communities. And we can design better public spaces when we actually come together. So nearly all of the conversations I've had over the years with planners, the authors, urbanists, the specialists in the field have had some form of these elements. So I've heard these key points so many times, they nearly always come up. <laughs> and, you know, I think it's a good reason that they come up because it's it's true. Hmm. Is, there, uh, is there one of those things that really stands out to you or do you think that they all, all of it kind of works as an interwoven web and there's... There's even more complexity to this than we realize. Yeah, you know, I think I think what you just said there, there's more complexity to it than we actually realize. Um, you know, it's it's a big thing to our health, too. I mean, we are attracted to nature. You know, that's just our innate desire. It's built within us because I feel like we are actually part of nature. So when we have, you know, trees, when we have green spaces, our lives are going to be healthier. You know, I remember reading a story, too, um, about hospital patients and hospital patients actually recover faster when they can see trees outside their window. And the key thing to this is that they actually recover faster even if there's a picture of a tree on the wall or a picture of like a landscape on the wall. People will recover faster from just ease or illness or accidents. And I think that's something that we don't always recognize. You know, we can build these these tall mixed use buildings, which is great. But then when you open your blinds and you see the building next to you and that's all you can see, that is actually going to impact your life, you know? And I really think it's important as we go through designing the built environment to make sure that there's enough green space there to when we open our blinds, we can see trees, we can see, you know, birds, because that is actually going to improve our lives overall. Mm -hmm. Well, I wonder as we kind of bring this to a close, if you could share a story with us about what you think can happen when communities work well or what has happened when you've seen a community that works well or, or anything along those lines. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I think it kind of goes back um, to walkability because when I moved to D.C. in 2011, it was the first city 
that was designed in a way that allowed me to sell my car. And this really had an immediate impact on my life. You know, I was more happy. I slept better. I felt better and more ha- more healthier. Um, and I was less stressed. And it really completely transformed my life. And to me, that was a life-changing experience. Um, but then, you know, in 2015, I left D.C. and I moved to Los Angeles. And I actually bought a car my first day here. I, I literally took an Uber <laughs> from the airport to the car dealership <laughs> because I knew... L.A. was such a car-centric city. Now, I mean, like I had mentioned earlier, people do get around here by taking the bus or other means of public transportation. But honestly, I think, you know, L.A. is actually easier to navigate by car, which is unfortunate. Um, But I'll be honest, you know, driving again after living in D.C., it felt good. It felt freeing. Mm. And, you know, holding the wheel as I drive down the freeway sometimes is a great feeling. And I actually really love that because I've always loved to drive. But, you know, I mentioned to last, it was just last month that I moved to a more walkable neighborhood. And I, I now live in downtown Glendale, which is only a few miles from where I used to live. But everything is within walking distance now. Mm-hmm. And my car actually will sit in the garage for days. And, you know, I, I'm feeling healthier and happier again. I'm sleeping better. I'm able to walk to get dinner. I can walk to the park. I mentioned that I've been walking to the library. So I'm actually reading more. So I think walkability is really, it's what makes a community work well. And if we can walk to our local park in 10 minutes, as I mentioned, it improves our lives and it really makes that park experience the greatest it can be. Um, You know, and I I mentioned too, if you have to spend 20 minutes in your car to get to the park, it kind of diminishes the the park's impact on your life, you know? Mm. Um, So I think walkability is, it's, it's really important to me and it's something that I I can tell a lot of stories about, you know, walking in D.C., walking to work, biking too. You know, when I talk about walkability, um, cycling is right there in my mind as well because I used to to bike to work in D.C. some days when it wasn't cold. Um, So, you know, I got to to experience that as well. And, you know, I would love to get a bike here and just to start biking. Um, Again, it it doesn't feel like the safest city to, to bike in, so I have the most respect when I see a cyclist on the street and I always give them plenty of space and, you know, I'm very compassionate towards, towards them. Um, not everyone in LA is when they see a cyclist. So, but I have that understanding and I think that's kind of one thing too. And, you know, a lot of times when we're in our cars and we see a cyclist or we see a pedestrian, we feel like, oh, well, I'm better because I am in my car and I'm driving to work and, you know, but there's like this disconnect of, of mind thought. And when you're actually on the other side and you're actually cycling and you get to see what it's like to, to cycle in a city, especially like, like LA and to see what it's like to have cars flying by you just a foot away, it gives you a whole new perspective. And I think we all need to kind of understand that and to know that, you know, other point, other forms of transportation, walking, cycling, you know, they're all important and we all need to make sure that we, we understand that. And I think that's something that cities and planners need to understand more too, is that, you know, when we put down a bike lane, we don't just need to add a picture of a bike and an arrow. We need to add protected bike lanes. And I've seen this so many times to where they'll actually put down a striped bike lane next to a row of parked cars. But if they would only move the cars over and put the bike lane on the opposite side of the parked cars so the parked cars act as a buffer you would have a protected bike lane Mm -hmm. without spending any more money and it would make it so much easier for um for drivers and also for cyclists so but that's something most cities don't do here in the u.s and i wish they would well what a what a compelling call to action there to wrap us up yeah (laughs) (laughs) Uh, absolutely well, uh, where can people find more about what you do, Ash? Yeah, I'm glad you asked. So Parksify is available at Parksify.com. Um, but I would love it if people could go over to iTunes. That's where a majority of the listeners come from. So go over to iTunes, hit the subscribe button. And if you're enjoying the podcast, feel free to leave a review. I would love that so other people can find it. Um, and, um, yeah, you can just search for Parksify or Parksify podcast on iTunes, and it will definitely come up. And if you're interested, too, in the Facebook group, I would love to mention that Parksify, it's ad-free, it's independent, 
it's all me. I do all the work. So I would love it if anyone could click that become a supporter link at the top. So it's 100% funded by supporting members for just $5 a month. And $5 a month, by the way, it gives you access to that private Facebook group where you could go on and have conversations with guests from the podcast and other supporting members. Well, wonderful. And if you're all listening and are interested in learning more about CityWorks Expo, you can find us at cityworksxpo.com. But thank you so much for taking the time today, Ash. Yeah, thank you so much, Brad. It's been really great speaking with you. Thank you for listening to the Big Ideas for Better Places podcast today. If you like what you hear, please subscribe and leave a rating. It really helps other people find out about our fascinating guests and find the information that we have to share. Lastly, please save the day for our upcoming event, October 5th through 7th in Roanoke, Virginia. And keep up to date by following us on Facebook and checking out our website, cityworksexpo.com. at cityworksxpo.com. Thank you guys again and look forward to seeing you next week. Thank you.